Welcome to the May meeting of the Dallas branch of ASE. I'd like to extend a welcome to all of our members, guests, and all of those joining us around the state, nation, and world. Last month, we had people joining us from Canada, other parts of the US, but mostly the great state of Texas. This month, we'll have a virtual YM event, which is mentioned further in our announcements, and an EWR Institute meeting. Please look on your emails for announcements for both of those. During our May meeting, we normally have Younger Member Month, which we have younger members reside over the meeting and in other elements of the meeting. A younger member is defined by ASCE as a member who is 35 years of age or under. During this meeting, we also have the Civil Engineering Clubs join us as well. We've decided we'll postpone this until a later time this year. Another item from the Texas section is the Texas Section Awards. These award nominations are due May 15th. Last year, the Dallas branch represented well in the engineering awards. So please nominate those who have had a great impact to the civil engineering field and your communities as a whole. Those nominations are due May 15th. There will be no scholarship raffle this month, and we also have no sponsor this month. So if you'd like to sponsor a future Dallas branch meeting, please let us know. We'll ha I'll turn it over to have our YM announcement, and then we'll, we'll have other announcements and then the main speaker. Hi everyone, I'm Nick Phillips, the YM Chair for ASC Dallas Chapter. I hope everyone's doing all right. I, uh, I know for sure everything is kind of changing for me. I for sure have a new addition to the family here. This is Ayla. Uh, so ASCE Y Young Members are going to have an event this month. We're going to be doing an online happy hour. We're sending out the information for the meeting through our YM newsletter. We will also be having a feature for the information and the meeting. Uh, in the chapter newsletter, we're going to be getting together. If you guys want to have a cocktail, have a beer, just hang out and play some games, we're going to be catching up with all the younger members and having a good time, uh, just checking out how everyone is and having a, good, having a good time with some games. So we'd love to have you all there. And it is on uh, May 14th at fifth, or, uh, 5 o'clock p.m. Wow, Nick, I wish I was a younger member and I could participate. Um, I just want to remind everybody that ASCE Texas section is holding their election until May 15th. So um, you should have received an email from the ASCE Texas section. So please go and vote. Also, ASCE Global is holding their annual elections, which run from May 1st to May 31st. So the candidates for president-elect are on the website. There are also candidates that we have for Region 6 governor. We have a, um, an election for that, and I encourage you to go read about the candidates and what they stand for. There's also a constitutional amendment proposed, and if you are a member of Texas Section, you would have gotten an email on May 6th giving you links to vote in these multiple elections and also sharing that the Region 6 Board of Governors unanimously voted to recommend voting no on the um, constitutional amendments. So if you have any questions, reach out to one of the Region 6 governors or the Texas section or Global ASCE about your voting credentials. I encourage our membership to vote. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ozzy Gonzalez, our branch's fundraising chair. I would like to take a moment to ask you to consider becoming a branch sponsor. We still have sponsorship opportunities available at all the branch levels and also for this year's joint meeting. If you are interested, please visit our website at dallasac.org or email me at fundraising at dallasace.org. It's because of this engineering community's generosity that we are able to keep going. We greatly appreciate all your support. This is Brad Russell, your Dallas Chapter ASC Scholarship Chair, and I wanted to give you an update on this year's scholarship, the GB Mann Scholarship. This is a scholarship awarded to high school senior students who attend school in the Dallas Branch region which includes Collin, Cook, Dallas, then Ellis, Kaufman, Navarro, and Rockwall counties, and who will be attending an institution of higher learning in the 2020 fall semester in pursuit of a degree in civil engineering. The deadline for this scholarship application has been extended to 5 p.m. Friday, May 15th. You can find information about this scholarship, both the application form and the reference forms on the Dallas ASCE website, which is dallasasce.org backslash branch underscore scholarships. At the bottom of the application form, you're given a mailing address and an email address to send the completed forms to. 
Good luck to the nominations and I look forward to receiving a number of applications. Kent Collins PE is a director of public works for the city of Capel, Texas, where he leads a diverse team that provides service in the areas of water, wastewater, streets, traffic, facilities, fleet, capital development, engineering, and inspections. Prior to his current role, Kent served as the assistant director over engineering. Mr. Collins has spent his entire 25 year professional career in public service in public works and transportation, having worked for the Texas A&M Transportation Institute, DFW Airport, the town of Flower Mound, the city of Capel. Kent holds a BS and MS degree in civil engineering, both from Texas A&M University, and as a professor, professional engineering in the state of Texas. Please let us welcome Kent to speak to us today. Thank you, Julie. I uh, appreciate that. Um, makes me sound older than I really am. Um, let me uh, begin by saying that, you know, I hope that everyone's watching uh, has been able to stay safe and healthy during the coronavirus pandemic uh, and to thank ASCE Dallas Chapter for inviting me to share some of our experiences and our response as a service organization to COVID-19. Um, this presentation is going to be focused on our organization's response to COVID-19 and more specifically on Public Works' response as a department. Um, I'm going to give a little bit of background on the city for those that are not familiar with Coppell um, so you can understand um, a little bit better how we make decisions and then I'll go through some of our experiences which may or may not be similar to what you experienced uh, depending on what your role is or the, the organization that, that you work for. So for those that, that are not familiar with Coppell, um, location-wise, we're, uh, we're just north of DFW Airport and adjacent to DFW Airport. Um, we've got a population of about uh, 42,000 people. Um, we, we grew fast in the late, in the, the 1990s and early 2000s. And from a residential perspective, we were mostly built out um, by the, the early, uh, early aughts. Um, and our, our commercial growth is heavily influenced by the DFW airport. Um, and I'm showing a map here. And if you look at the west side of the city, you can kind of see where the residential, um, this is our utility and streets map. Um, you can kind of see where the residential uh, stops in our commercial area um, picks up kind of in this area. And that, those were um, policy decisions made um, years ago because of the flight path um, uh, for DFW Airport. Uh, we try to keep the, the flight path out um, from going over our residential areas. Uh, so we do have a heavy commercial warehouse, um, a lot of sales tax generated from the west side of our city. Um, and I'll, I'll mention that's origin-based sales tax. Um, we have a very strong school district. It is a primary attraction for people moving to Coppell. Um, we, we have a decent amount of retail, but probably less storefront um, brick and mortar retail than a lot of communities. Again, the focus was on um, the kind of warehouse sales tax. Uh, and that, that was a focused and, and um, purposeful decision, policy decision that was made years ago. Um, as an organization, we've, you know, we've gone through growing pains uh, as we were growing fast. Um, but over about the last 15 to 20 years, there's been a, a real strong service culture um, that was developed within the organization. And when I say service, it's, it's service to customers, service to each other. Um, we really place a high value on teamwork and working together to, to deliver that outstanding service um, and with a servant's heart. Um, and I, you know, I will mention that uh, there were a number of uh, things that were happening that we were already preparing to uh, reduce our budget. And so we've, we've had positions frozen for uh, quite a few months, uh, positions that were open and we froze them. Um, and we also were looking at reducing our uh, maintenance contracts dur uh, for the, the current um, budget. 
Um, and the, you know, these were things, they were either legislation um, placing um, property tax revenue caps on cities and or uh, sales tax uh, rules that were uh, being proposed by the comptroller. Um, so as we were kind of heading into the coronavirus um, pandemic, uh, we were already positioning our, our budget um, and our expenditures um, do, to, to prepare for outside influences besides the coronavirus. So you know, I just want to mention that as, as I get into some of the decisions that, that we've been able to make, um, that, uh, that we were already pretty well positioned from a budget perspective because of other things that we were preparing for. Um, so talk a little bit about public works as a department. Um, this is a photo from our 2018 Public Works Week celebration. Um, you know, National Public Works Week is, is coming up here um, a week after, well, next week, um, begins next Monday. And um, we have an organization, um, our whole organization, the city's organization, about 420 employees, and we have about 55 uh, full-time equivalent positions in public works. So we're the fourth largest department in, in the city. Uh, we do serve functions of engineering facilities. We have a CIP and ADA um, group. Uh, we have a, we have fleet, obviously, and from the, the photo, that's that's one of our fleet bays, streets, traffic, water, sewer, and then and, and administration. Um, we've also, you know, I, I talked about our organizational culture, um, and Public Works has had a uh, kind of a, a service mindset for for a long time, but over the past few years, we've really uh, adopted a, a deeper and focused culture mindset um, as first responders. And so we talk about preparing, training, and responding as first responders, and then we we try to act with the values of service and teamwork and innovation. Um, because we really do think that those things embody how we go about our work um, on a daily basis. Um, so it's, you know, it's important that we work as teams. It's important that we think forward, think outside the box. Um, and I mention those things because um, I think that it has prepared our department to deal with some of the challenges that the, um, that the pandemic has thrown at us as an organization as, and as a department. Um, and then, you know, as I described public works, you know, we have a very diverse group. Um, we have everything from field staff that are, you know, they're in the water, they're in the sewer, they're, they're patching potholes, working on equipment, uh, repairing our vehicles and equipment. Um, they interact with residents and businesses. Um, and then we also have engineering staff and architects and folks that are really kind of managing and reviewing plans. And um, so we have, we have probably the most diverse mix of staff of any of the departments uh, within the city. So we're a little unique there. Um, this is, you know, this displays or presents kind of our normal day-to-day -day responsibilities for the city. Um, and I'll be talking about how some of these have changed as as we were um, hit with the uh, the pandemic or COVID-19, um, you know, and it's it's worth mentioning as you look at these responsibilities, um, you know, the federal laws that were put into place in response to COVID-19 designated public works employees as emergency responders, and so. Um, we were sort of put in that category as essential, uh, as essential employees, but also as emergency responders. Okay, so why am I putting up a, a, a slide with a photo of St. Louis and a volleyball game up? Um, well, so for me personally, um, at the end of spring break week, uh, March 12th, my family and I, we were planning to fly to St. Louis for a volleyball tournament for uh, my twin daughters who play club volleyball. Um, and that, uh, so that was March 12th. The World Health Organization declared COVID-19 as a global pandemic on March 11th. Um, so 
the tournament was canceled, flights and hotels were canceled. Um, the following Monday, um, we as an organization had our first COVID-19 response meeting with our leadership team. And really this is when things really started to change for our organization. Um, you know, that's when uh, shortly thereafter, the county orders for stay at home started uh, falling into place. Um, and, you know, I, just to kind of give a, an early um, example of how we were responding. I had a, a public works employee who had flown to Ireland for a spring break trip. Um, while he was in the air over the Atlantic, Ireland was placed on the, um, the high risk country travel list. Um, and so he and his, and his wife literally landed, decided that it was too risky to stay, um, turned around, changed their return flight, flew back uh, the next day. And as he landed, uh, we informed him that he needed to self quarantine for 14 days. Um, so he didn't have much of a spring break trip. Annie, Annie was met with our what was really our first response to COVID-19, um, you know, and so we were, we were about this, you know, this time we were starting to respond to uh, the county orders regarding um, social distancing, limiting the numbers of gatherings, you know, they, they had dropped it, I think, initially to 250 and then 100 and then 10. Um, and we, um, as, a, as an organization, as a city, we closed our public activity facilities on March 14th. Um, and we also activated our emergency operations center, our EOC. Um, and we began daily incident action meetings. Um, so we, we have an emergency um, coordinator and uh, we stood up the EOC. We were having more, uh, daily morning calls uh, we were starting to track all of our, our time spent on the COVID-19. Um, we, we started to stockpile and inventory all of the things that, um, that we were seeing we were going to need in response to, to COVID-19. Um, and, and I would say that the EOC was extremely helpful in getting those efforts organized um, and sort of in alignment with how a typical emergency response um, should, should go. Um, we also initiated a policy group. Um, and so what we're dealing with was everything from um, a federal law, right? Um, and, and county orders and the state rules. And we're trying to balance that with what are typical um, employment laws and EEOC laws and, and regulations. And I will tell you that those, those meetings were mind numbing um, and extremely long, and, but very important because we need to make sure that um, as we're allowing and thinking about allowing people to work from home, did we have a proper telecommute policy? Um, as folks are staying home to take care for their children, um, you know, we were thinking about things before some of these rules came down and how are we gonna treat those employees? Are we gonna be able to, um, to, to pay them? Uh, what are they gonna do while they're home if their job doesn't lend itself to, um, to working from home? I mentioned our public facilities were closed we have a lot of employees that that is their job. Um, we have a community rec recreation center. We have a biodiversity education center. Um, we have a life safety park. Uh, we have folks who are, their, their job is to run those facilities, to program those facilities. And those are large gathering spaces. Uh, when those doors close, um, what do those people do? So those are some of the challenges that we had to deal with early on um, as, as we're closing the doors to those facilities. Um, and then we have some facilities that sort of remained open, um, but staff was still reporting. So, uh, you know, that's, that's one of the things that a city has to deal with is kind of that mixture of staffing. Um, so this slide, it, it's got, you know, I've got two photos or two, two graphics here. The one on the top left 
uh, was one of our uh, COVID-19 dashboards. Um, and this is, uh, I think, Dallas County's dashboard, or, or maybe the regional dashboard. I mean, it reminded us daily of the growing um, pandemic and impact in Coppell. Um, and I just looked, and you know, to, as of uh, May 6, there's uh, 27 COVID-19 cases in Coppell, um, and an, and 4,865 cases in in Dallas County. Um, you know, but this was a, a growing thing that we're we're dealing with. Um, but it's not a traditional disaster where you know incident command is easily applied. And so, so some of the traditional ICS methods, um, you know, could tend to, um, you know, we had to work hard to make sure those ICS methods didn't create any silos where they weren't intended. And I would say that our uh, emergency operating uh, operations folks did a really good job of making sure um, that they were communicating out with all the departments, making sure the needs were being met. Um, at the same time, keeping a good inventory and controlling um, those, uh, the inventory of supplies. Um, so, um, you know, again, um, the game changer for the city uh, was when the decision was made to close all facilities to the public access, and that happened on March 23rd. Um, so for us, that's when the majority of our office staff ended up going to a communicate a telecommute work situation. Um, so we, while we had a work a flexible workplace policy, we really kind of had to scramble um, to implement some uh, a more detailed telecommuting policy about what are your what are your goals? How are we going to um, uh, uh, check in with folks on a regular basis? Um, you know we. Our IT department, we, we have a lot of laptops deployed within our workforce anyway, um, and we have a refreshed schedule. And so fortunately, they had quite a few retired laptops that they were able to go in and recommission and get to folks that did not have the right um, technology to work from home. Um, you know, we initially, we shifted to Skype meetings for our communications, um, but we, uh, pretty quickly identified some shortcomings for, of, of Skype for Business. Um, so we, we also um, adopted Zoom for the larger meetings. Um, and that's, that's what we use for our larger meetings and our council meetings, any of our boards and commissions, um, we've, we've utilized Zoom. Most of our internal meetings, we still um, will use Skype for those. Um, you know, we uh, internally, in terms of meetings, uh, typically um, in, in my leadership team in Public Works, we would huddle on Mondays and Fridays, um, which is kind of a standing 10 to 15 minute meeting, and then have a more robust staff meeting on Wednesdays. Um, you know, we, we scrapped the Wednesday staff meeting and we just go to a, a daily huddle. Um, and then we actually do a weekly recap at the end of the day on Friday where we just kind of get together, sit around, chat about what's going on. Um, don't, we don't talk about business so much. It's just more about, um, you know, uh, restoring and making sure we're, we continue to build on our uh, relationships. Um, you know, we... Uh, we had somebody in our operations group that um, had a close exposure to someone who tested positive um, and uh, for for COVID-19, and we we had to respond to that basically as if that individual also tested positive. Um, he had some higher risk coworkers, um, so he was quarantined for 14 days. Um, his higher risk coworkers were also quarantined out of uh, kind of an abundance of caution. Um, and we went in, uh, that was on a Friday. We went in Friday night and Saturday did a deep cleaning of their workspace. Uh, space. We used um, the, the foggers to disinfect the whole area. Um, so, you know, we fortunately, knock on wood, we have not had any um, any of our employees test positive so far, 
but we've had to react in a way that, that they have um, in a couple of occasions. Um, and I guess I wanted to pause here for just a second and say, um, talk about our staffing. Uh, I mentioned that we were already preparing for some budget reductions. Um, and so we were in a pretty good position um, to absorb some of what's happened with COVID-19. And as, a, as an organization, um, we, we have, you know, we froze the positions, the open positions. Um, and so we have not um, had to furlough um, or, uh, or reduce staff. Um, we've, we've had a, we have a, a very robust online learning management system. So as those facilities closed and people had to work from home more, um, if they weren't able to do their actual job or their traditional job, we've assigned them um, training. We've assigned them other jobs to do. Um, and for field crews that rotate off um, on a particular day, they're also doing a lot of training and but they're also continuously on call um, and so we have policies in place that if something breaks loose and we need to call them back they have to respond within 15 minutes and report back within a, a certain uh, time period as well i want to talk a little bit about safety you know traditional ppe um, is for public works is what we see kind of in that left hand top left hand corner right hard hat uh, work boots, maybe ear protection, eye protection, gloves. Um, but when with the COVID-19, uh, you know, our PPE, because we are emergency responders, um, you know, now we're, we're wearing masks, we're wearing bandanas. Um, you know, initially the CDC was not recommending the use of masks um, and uh, for, for non-medical um, uh, workers. Uh, and then they came back and said, we should be wearing those masks. At that point, we couldn't procure them because they're all gone. Um, so we actually found a local um, supplier who was able to get material and make bandanas for us that we then fashion into face masks. Um, you know, we have signs that we've posted all over the place reminding people about social distancing or physical distancing. Um, We've, we've procured enough cleaning supply and uh, paper towels so that if there is an interaction at the beginning of every day, uh, we expect folks to wipe down their workspace, wipe down door handles. Um, we, have, uh, we have janitorial staff that we have as day porters at all of our open facilities. Um, our fleet staff is wiping down vehicles. Um, you know, we, we had... Um, <laughs> We had a, a, our facility manager at one at one point. Um, he had a a, um, a family member uh, who had who had a coworker who was, who tested positive, and he, um, in an abundance of caution, without letting anybody know, actually came back, went home, got some clothes, clean clothes, came back to the office, and slept in his office to minimize exposure to anyone else. Um, you know, we qu quickly told him that was not going to be necessary uh, going forward. But that was an example of someone just kind of taking it on themselves to protect others, um, you know, as they're responding to this, uh, to this pandemic. Um, also wanted to, to share, you know, at the end of, towards the end of March, um, I got an email from one of our, our field crews asking to meet with me. Um, at that point, we were still, um, we were having all of our field crews report uh, to the office, to their trucks, and go out, um, and they, uh, and I agreed to meet with him. Um, he showed up with uh, five other guys, um, and so we sat down um, more than six feet apart, and we had a conversation about because um, they they all kind of walked in as one large group, and we're not social distancing. Um, and so, you know, I listened to their concerns because what they were sharing was were real fears um, about working working closely with other other people in an environment that did not, at that point, seem to be, um, you know, they were not seeing things being wiped down to to what you know they had, would hope. And so, um, you know, we talked about making sure that they were maintaining social distance. 
um, that they were, you know, doing their part in cleaning their workspace. Um, and then we also, the next week, went to a policy uh, where we had um, shifted to where only one crewman per vehicle going out um, after that. Uh, to again to allow better separation between guys. Um, so yeah, our our job does go on. Uh, we have to continue to respond. Um, you know, one of the things we we noticed real early on was when people were asked to uh, to stay at home or shelter in place, um, the traffic volumes uh, dropped significantly. Um, not you know, no secret there. You know, we're fortunate. We ha we do have an ATMS uh, signal system. Um, you know, we have NLI, MaxView. We've recently gone to all McCain controllers. And so really with a, a quick phone call to our signal techs, you know, we were able to go from a very, I would say, complicated um, system of, you know, progression uh, in the morning. Uh, you know, we have we have probably had three plans for each morning. We had a, a, a midday weekday uh, plan, and then um, an afternoon school peak uh, plan, and then and then the evening plan. And um, so we were able to to really take those out, go to our weekend uh, progression plan, uh, reduced our cycle length, much more responsive, and we were able to do that very quickly. So we were fortunate there. Um, you know, our fleet uh, group, they continue to operate at a very high level. Um, and in fact, uh, last month they were just awarded uh, for the third year in a row, um, one of the 100 best fleets um, in North America. Uh, you know, we, we have, uh, we're on InterGov, which is a Tyler product um, for our land development process. So we use InterGov and Bluebeam. We're continuing to, uh, to review plans electronically. Um, so we were kind of already on a pla paperless platform, um, so we've continued that work. Um, we're, we're actually in a, in a reorganization process with our field crews to, um, to go from a crew leader um, setup where they, they are, we don't have field supervisors to one where we do have field supervisors, um, and that effort is still ongoing. Um, at this point, all of our, most of our teams are on a rotation of some sort. Uh, we're continuing, you know, as I mentioned, we're in our budget process and, you know, we're, we're continuing that. We, uh, we, we have city council meetings, which I just I described via Zoom. Um, you know, we had a time period, um, Republic Waste is our uh, solid waste provider. And we had a period where they were not comfortable continuing bulk trash pickup. Um, so they stopped that, and we went to roll-offs, uh, and that was a big mess. Anybody who's gone to a roll-off situation knows how uh, what that can look like. Um, but it did provide the service that uh, that Republic could not provide for time period. Um, you know, we we've seen that our projects, our capital projects, have slowed a little, um, but they are continuing. You know, right now. We have an art center that's still um, under construction. We're rebuilding Freeport Parkway. We're uh, rebuilding Parkway Boulevard right outside um, our city hall here. Uh, we've got residential street under construction. Now told probably you know about $45 million in, um, in capital projects that's going on. Um, you know, our, our engineering inspectors, um, they're a group that have continued, continued to report to the office um, every day and, and do their inspections. Um, you know, one of the things we've asked them to do is think about remote inspections. How would that, what would that look like? Could we use drones um, to provide those inspections? Do we put that on the contractors or the developers um, to, to provide video of the work that we need to inspect? Um, you know, I will say that we uh, as a city, we're expected to police the reduced workforce um, that was um, placed on the contractors. Um, so that has that has had some impact on our our projects and and the our contractors' crews. Um, and I'll just mention we do a a lot of leadership and culture training um, in Coppell. Um, Pat Lincioni is is one of our go-to sources. 
Um, and I'll, I'll just share that he has a podcast series out there. It's really good. Um, and, and one of them is it focuses on the five dysfunctions of a virtual team. Um, so if you know of Pat Lencioni, uh, I would, you know, search that up. It helps. It's really good advice and, and good information to make sure that your teams stay healthy while you uh, work remote from each other. Um, I, I want to mention here, um, we, you know, we are rebuilding Freeport Parkway um, and we had a basically a smart work zone that was in place uh, through throughout the duration of construction. Um, it's really winding down and with the lighter traffic volumes, there aren't a lot of traffic impacts associated with the construction. So we asked um, TTI, who's helping us with that uh, smart work zone project, um, to reprogram our, uh, our PCMS boards and just have them as a, kind of a PSA. So I'll, I'll flip through that. Basically says eat local, social distance. Um, so that was one of the changes that, that we made uh, a few weeks ago. Um, so what is, what's next for us? Um, you know, there's, there's definitely some questions um, and we don't have all the answers. You know, it's, it's a, it is a fluid situation to some extent. Um, I, you know, I guess one of the questions is, you know, is working home gonna be a permanent situation for some of our folks? Um, you know, I would submit that at least for part of the time um, each week, that probably will be um, part of our new reality. Um, you know, are we going to limit crew sizes? You know, can we sustain the one person per truck? Um, that probably is not sustainable. Um, but if they're in the truck, you know, do we provide an N95 mask or some something closer to that um, besides the uh, the bandanas or the, the fabric masks that we have now? Um, do we think that uh, as we start to open up, um, you know, we'll have limited walk-in activity, but there will be some people that need or want that uh, that face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, we'll continue temperature checks for our our staff as we come in. Um, you know, we will be asking. Uh, I've got some um, some signs here, some sign designs. You know, we'll be asking visitors to self-assess before they come in. Um, we will require them to wear a face mask or a face covering. Um, if they don't have one, we've got some temporary uh, cloth masks they could use. Um, you know, we have, and I've got some photos here of what it's going to look like on Monday as we, uh, as we open our doors here um, at 265 Parkway uh, to some of our, our customers. Um, you know, we put them on notice to social distance, to wash their hands, to use hand sanitizer. Um, we've used uh, stanchions to channelize them to the front counters. We've got messages up. We have uh, little doorbells that we've put up so that our staff does not have to sit at the front counter, but that they will know when someone comes in and needs service. Um, we're looking at permanent screens at our front counters for uh, kind of a long-term um, solution. Uh, we, we're looking at how can we reconfigure our entries so that they're all touchless. Um, you know, whether that's a rotating door or with a sensor, something like that. Um, you know, from a uh, um, you know, business opening standpoint, um, you know, we will continue to rely on education and reinforcing guidance from the CDC and the state and the county. Uh, we get calls from, from residents saying, hey, you know, I, I noticed this business was open and they don't fit the, uh, you know, they don't fit the criteria. Well, we'll reach out to that business and kind of re-educate them and tell them, you know, you really uh, maybe, you know, we reading the rules, you should not be open. Um, and what we've found that at least so far, that type of education reinforcement, kind of a gentle touch is, um, has been enough to keep our, uh, our businesses um, operating in a way that, that they're in compliance. So um, that is, that's some of the answers that we have. And I know that, that we will, um, you know, we, we will, discover things that we that we haven't thought about and be able to uh, we'll have to continue to be nimble um, and agile as we go forward 
So uh, I'm sure I've failed to share some of the details that we've gone through. So hopefully there'll be some good questions that, uh, that I can answer um, to fill in the blanks. Uh, and I, I guess in closing, I'd like to thank you for your time and your attention. Um, I wish you all continued safety and health as we move forward towards reopening our communities. Thank you very much. Hi, Kent. I have a question. Yes. This is Nancy. Um, have you seen any increase in traffic that went along, and how have you worked with your traffic signals to do with that? Um, we are starting to, uh, so the question was, have we seen an uptick in, uh, in, in traffic here recently with things opening up? Um, and I, in response, I would say, A, yes, uh, there's definitely an increase in traffic. I notice it more on the freeways, um, kind of commuter traffic, uh, a little less at the local level. Um, part of that's driven by the schools still being out. Um, you know, we still have limited opening for the businesses that are open. Um, and so we're, we're still operating our signals basically with that single um, kind of weekend plan. Um, and, you know, typically we would operate that way throughout the summer month anyway. So I don't see any significant changes. Um, you know, if, if we go to where all the businesses are completely open, we'll probably have to look at going to a morning and an evening peak plan. Um, but so far, uh, that reduced cycle length is, is working well for us. Kent, this is Mark. Uh, how, uh, what goes into implementing uh, the emergency? Oh, first off, I wanted to, tell, to, add, to thank you for presenting to our group today. Really appreciate it on behalf of the board and our membership be setting aside the time. Very welcome. Um, what goes into implementing uh, the emergency operations center? Did it require uh, people's roles to change or more staff to be brought in? Yes, so the question is what's, uh, what's involved in standing up the EOC? Um, for us, you know, it's, it's really our, um, our typically our EOC managers uh, would be our incident commanders, would be our fire and police chiefs. And, and basically they would communicate with the city manager and to decide to, um, to stand up the EOC. And then what happens is there's, you know, we have a, uh, a communication list that gets notified, hey, we're, we're standing up the EOC. Um, here's the response plan that's been developed. Um, and in this case, Yes, they did identify specific roles, and that's what would happen with any incident, right? There's specific roles that are needed, um, specific coordinators that are needed, and um, and so in, in this case with COVID-19, you know, they identified folks that were going to be responsible for facilities, um, folks who were responsible for you know for law enforcement and for fire and EMS response, um, people who were um, you know, for looking at supply and stockpile, things like that. And um, at, at that point, we had closed the doors to our public access or our public activity uh, centers. So we had some, uh, some staff that were, you know, highly capable, um, but did not, were not able to do their traditional job um, because those facilities were closed. And so they were sort of um, pegged to fill some of those slots. Um, you know, obviously we have, we had somebody that was responsible for kind of any utility issues. Well, you know, for us, that's our, our water, um, our utility manager, right? So that's a natural. Um, and so for a while we had, and we had, a, you know, as a finance function, a while, for a while, we had all those people responding to our EOC. We have a physical EOC down at our life safety park. Um, and that went on for maybe, I don't know the time frame. Um, time has seemed to um, kind of, the, the definition of time has seemed to be changed through this. But, uh, you know, they, they were down there, say, for a couple of weeks, maybe um, on, on a daily basis. And then, um, and then we went to a virtual EOC. So, um, and that's kind of been the case going um, since then. So we're still in a virtual EOC. 
which is again helpful in maintaining that organization and structure, uh, making sure we're, we're keeping on top of inventories and timesheets and things like that. Hey Kent, I have a, one last question. So do certain divisions within the city of Capel, did they have a, a little bit stricter requirements during COVID-19? For example, your public works department, you know, your inspectors and maintenance crews, or do they all follow the same um, basic principles when, when um, going out in the field and, and doing their job? And yeah, and uh, so the basic answer is we expect everyone when they're at work um, or out in public to really act the same. And that is to follow the guidance that's, um, that's provided to us by the federal, state, and county governments. Um, you know, so we do talk a lot about social distancing or maintaining that six feet of that physical separation. Um, we, you know, we have we have the CDC signs posted, you know, all over our facilities, uh, reminding people to wash their hands properly, use hand sanitizer, and now to cover your your face if you're going out in public and may be interacting with uh, with someone, um, you know, like so, you know, our inspectors, right? They have to go on job sites. You know, our expectation is when you're out there and you're interacting with a contractor um, to you know, maintain your social distance, maintain that, that uh, six feet or more. There's no reason that you cannot communicate with them, um, you know, and, and have to go inside that space. Uh, you know, when we've asked people, so we are returning to work um, and, uh, you know, we're asking people, enter through the side doors, um, you know, if you're up and moving around and you may actually interact with someone, wear your face covering. Um, the bandanas are really nice because you can just tie them around your neck and then whenever you need them, you just put them up, up over your, uh, your nose and your mouth and you're good to go. Um, so those actually have worked pretty well for our public work staff. Kent, we want to thank you for being willing to speak to us today. It's been great hearing how the City of Capel has adapted this pandemic and the ever-changing situation that we're all in. It seems like the City of Capel has thrived in this situation. This month, please look to your emails for the EWR Technical Seminar. It'll be sent to you later on this month. Next month's meeting will more than likely be another virtual meeting, but we're not for sure. Please watch your email and the Dallas Branch social media for any updates. The meeting is scheduled for June 8th. You should see a link at the end of the presentation, which will take you to a Google form. This is how we'll know who to send a PDH certificate to. On the form, there's a code that you'll need to type in to receive the certificate. The code is CAPEL. If you have any trouble, please let us know at info at Dallas ASC or any of our social media platforms. Again, the code is CAPEL. If you have any additional questions you want to ask our speaker today, please put those in the comments section and we'll send those to him and send you back the responses. He may even answer while we're live today. In the end, I couldn't do this on my own. It's a team effort. So thanks to those who have helped put this meeting on. Thanks for attending the virtual meeting of the Dallas branch, and I hope you have a great week. With that, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Thanks for joining us.